Welcome back to Neighboring. Neighboring is a series of interviews where we ask our friends, community leaders, pastors, business owners, this question, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? Today I'm here with Joe Johns, senior pastor at Fellowship Missionary Church here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, Joe, we've known each other for a long time and uh, have done a lot of life together. And I've always just valued your opinion on what this idea of neighboring uh, really kind of means. And so thanks for joining me today in this conversation and hopefully share some light from a pastor's perspective. So please introduce yourself, tell us uh, about your church and we'll start there. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for the invitation. It's good to be here and chat with you. Um, yeah, my name is Joe Johns and uh, I'm the senior pastor at Fellowship Missionary Church. I've been a part of that community, Southeast Side uh, Fort Wayne community for um, about 18 years now. And uh, Southside is a diverse congregation. It's a church in and for and with Southeast Fort Wayne. We were planted way back in 1982 uh, on the edge of the Southeast Quadrant and um, are still exploring what that calling is to us as a community to Southeast Fort Wayne and beyond. We are a, a missionary church, as our name says, so we're, we're trying to um, continue moving into that calling to be everyday missionaries, to be um, good news to the neighbors around us. So this idea of neighboring is and should be central to uh, any church's perspective on themselves. How are we um, neighbors uh, to those around us and who is our neighbor? It's a key, key question. So I'm glad for this series of conversations on neighboring. Um, fellowship has benefit greatly through our partnership with NeighborLink. Um, we like to say that NeighborLink has fueled many of what we called our go days, which is to get out into uh, our communities, get outside of the church walls, out to where our neighbors are, and um, be light and life and hope and encouragement uh, to them. So I, I think this this podcast series is very timely, very relevant. Church has always been about, about creating a space, creating community. Uh, but one of the unique things about fellowship, um, you know, 15, 15, 18 years ago, uh, around the same time that you were, that you came on staff, there was this, this really move and this embrace to uh, really reflect and embrace the the neighborhood rather than just being a congregation where people drove in and participated in the congregation. Uh, there was this move and this really almost a cultural change to start embracing kind of that neighborhood. And we're having a deep desire to to have Sunday mornings or church be a representation of the neighborhood. Tell us about that process. Like what were some of the key things that uh, for the leadership and for the church that really moved that direction and and desired to make that happen. Yes, in 1982, um, Southeast Fort Wayne was, was very different than it is currently. Um, that was prior to, you know, one of the biggest employers in Southeast Fort Wayne, or just around the time, the biggest employer, International Harvester, which at one time employed, it was a city w within itself, uh, it employed 60,000 people during wow. its heyday. Um, uh, that industry was on the wane, and in 1982, there was parts of Southeast Fort Wayne that were still flourishing, and one might have thought that at, at that time, Southeast Fort Wayne uh, you know, might still become like what Southwest Fort Wayne or Northwest Fort Wayne or Northeast, for that matter, any of the other quadrants, um, we might have followed suit, but in those um, decades since there was uh, a pullout, uh, a collapse of a lot of the manufacturing and industry, uh, tax bases eroded, and then there um, was, uh, one could say, a lack of flourishing uh, beginning to happen in the streets of Southeast Fort Wayne. But in 1982, um, uh, God led the leaders of fellowship at that time to, to, to plant the congregation in and the edge of the Southeast quadrant on Tillman Road in a cornfield and um, 
there was this expectation, that there wasn't an expectation that Southeast Fort Wayne would be, um, become um, challenged in the ways that it has, but that's all by God's design as we look back on it. Uh, at that time, Fellowship was a very different congregation. It was, it was very uh, young and upwardly mobile for uh, the first um, decade plus, some um, earnest, um, faith-filled people seeking the Lord and established a really strong foundation. Um, but as we moved into the mid to late 90s and I guess you could say early 2000s, there was kind of a, a reckoning going on that um, as Southeast Fort Wayne was experiencing challenge, we were asking, well, um, what does that mean for us? And one, one significant learning we went through is, is uh, together understanding, um, in a way, how much who is our neighbor and what does it mean uh, to love our neighbors as, as our surrounding community um, was changing in some ways, the question became, how do we, as a community that's planted here, how do we reflect our neighborhood? How do we c become more diverse um, ethnically, culturally, racially, economically, um, just as our neighborhood um, is changing, how will we change? And so um, there were some very intentional conversations about what does it mean to embrace a level of diversity um, practically and, and, and starting theologically. I mean, what the um, Bible teaches that we understand is that heaven is going to be an incredibly diverse place. Hmm. And so the thought is, well, maybe we should start practicing that now. Let's yeah. not be surprised when we get there and every, every tongue, tribe, and nation is around the throne worshiping each other. We ought to get a head start on that. And so there was an intentional drive to uh, understand our neighbor who was right next to us, our brother and sister, in order that we might be able to better understand um, our neighbor out in our surrounding neighborhoods. And, and that, that diversity has only increased um, both at Fellowship and in our surrounding neighborhood. I mean, literally, our neighbors just to the north of us in Eastland Gardens, um, there, there uh, is a diversity growing um, among um, Burmese folks moving in as they become um, anchored and resettled into our community. They're um, prospering in a way that they're buying homes and mm. properties. And so literally right across the street um, from my office, uh, in two different directions, I have Muslim neighbors. Yeah. And uh, so, again, the, the timeliness of saying, well, what does it mean um, to be someone who, who loves their neighbor is right, um, right on our doorstep. The, the Christian faith, obviously, um, and the Bible, all through the Bible, there's, there's this propensity and there's a lot of language and a lot of passages on this idea of what it means to, to love our neighbor and to, uh, to be called, really. The Christian faith calls its believers to, to follow Jesus into uh, a lot of places in the margins, specifically. Uh, as a pastor of a, of a congregation and in the context of this series of trying to introduce people to different points of view, um, share more about like some, some context, some biblical context from a pastor's kind of point of view. Uh, what does it mean to be a neighbor from a, from a biblical basis? Like it some foundational mm -hmm. language or texts on that. Yeah, well, one very clear example of a teaching that we get straight from Jesus, he was asked um, by a religious leader, you know, who exactly is my neighbor? Because that was a concept um, to love God and, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was a long-standing understanding about how to how to pursue one's faith, and that that has always been a key question. Well, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus was asked that, and he responded with a super rich um, story, um, the story of the Good Samaritan, which um, is essentially a guy gets beat up by life and uh, there's a group of people that the people of that day would have readily understood as people who um, don't associate and um, are not neighbors in fact they're enemies and the story uh, goes on to have the surprise twist and an ending essentially jesus is saying uh, look neighbor love and enemy love are the same thing 
Hmm. Yeah, the surprise twist is that uh, those who you think are different from you, those who you think um, um, you don't have anything in common or you have disagreements with, actually, um, to be a neighbor is to be um, connected to them and to love and serve them. So it's a very radical teaching. It's a teaching that Jesus and uh, the story of the church embraced radically. And then you see this power to bring healing to communities when um, you have this sensibility about who your neighbor is. Um, and wherever there's divisions mm -hmm. between those who you would think are your neighbors, whether those divisions be economic divisions, cultural divisions, political divisions, as soon as we start dividing things out and saying they are not like me, they are different from me, they are less from me, uh, whatever the division holds, then we are, at that very point, we're moving away from loving our neighbor and moving towards something that is, is not going to lead towards flourishing. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a radical teaching to say uh, your neighbors are actually those who you think might be your enemies. Hmm. And we're called to love our neighbors. Um, Jesus really does some kung fu on that kind of principle and really turns the table and says, everyone's your neighbor. So this idea that that if, if I'm trying to identify who my neighbor is, if I'm, you know, really thinking about like, okay, who is my neighbor? How do I define that? Then there's this element that, that wherever I have division or anywhere, that, that maybe that person that is rubbing up against or that I don't know or makes me uncomfortable, that could be a really good signal that that person maybe is, is a neighbor that I need to connect with and that, that maybe I need to step over those, those lines. Right, and that's what the story says. There was people who came across this guy who was beat up, and um, because of where he was beat up and who he was assumed to be, it was assumed that um, you know there was reasons as to why he might beat up, and there was divisions that existed to where um, they didn't have responsibility towards them as a neighbor. Um, and so, as you just clarified, that that's what it is. That's that's the key question is this person my neighbor and do I have obligation yeah. to them? Because um, part of what's behind Jesus' teaching there that, that neighbor love and enemy love are the same thing is because uh, when, when God looks at us, his people, he sees humankind, he sees humanity. He doesn't see the divisions that we see. And the teaching aims to help us rise our vision of who people are to see we're, we're all one, um, we're all humans. And, and it's, you know, uh, becoming a better neighbor, loving your neighbor is about becoming a better human being. Hmm. Um, it's about becoming more human right. instead of the divisions make us become less human. And then we start dividing who's, who's more human and who's less human based yeah. on the way we treat people, right? Yeah. And, um, that teaching is a calling back to say, we're one, we're one. And that, that matters, like if you think about on a community level, how do we love one another in a community level? Like, um, it, it's kind of like everyone's on the same ship, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, if you got a big hole, like in the port side of the ship, uh, the people who are on the upper deck enjoying themselves um, might not see that hole but that hole in the port side of the deck, you know, when that ship hits that iceberg, it doesn't matter if what class you're in, whether you're in the lower class in the steerage compartment and you never get above deck, or if you're in the upper deck enjoying your champagne, um, the fact is there's a hole in your ship and it's going to ultimately affect everyone. Yeah. And um, the opposite of the neighboring idea is that... Um, we can have our section of whatever and the others are over there and whatever is happening is over there is really none of my concern mm. or I don't have to be concerned about that. But the fact is we're neighbors and we're actually all on the same ship. So if there's a big hole in Southeast Fort Wayne, ultimately that's not good for all of Fort Wayne, no matter where one might reside, um, no matter when, what one might thinks, uh, think about um, 
you know, the challenges Southeast Fort Wayne is having, it actually, because we're all neighbors together, it actually impacts us all. And we can kind of easily get into a thinking that says, well, that's, that's over there and that really doesn't have anything to do with me. And that's exactly what the passerby is to the guy who's beat up on the side of the road is thinking, well, this is this guy and this doesn't really have anything to do with me because he's not like me and I don't even live here, I'm just passing through. But, you know, if the ship goes down, we're all impacted. Joe, there's a lot of barriers that are in between that. Like you illustrate that there's these, there's, there's different subgroups in our own little communities and to illustrate that, and there's, there's typically barriers in between uh, between those areas of, of being a neighbor. What are some, what are just a, an, an idea or two of, if, if I'm recognizing this, like if I'm starting to understand who my neighbor is or starting to consider that or being open to that, but it's new for me, what are, and, I, and I'm identifying some barriers between, between whoever I am and whoever I've identified as my neighbor. What are some ways uh, that we can, that you think can, can help people move past those barriers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I go back to the story of the Good Samaritan. It's such a rich story and so nuanced. I mean, you could, you could mine that um, story for weeks about all the truth in it. But if you kind of boiled out the essential oil of the story, one thing that is just clear and not mistakable, the point of the story in part is in in becoming a good neighbor, somebody has to stop, hmm. right? Like there's no story. If nobody stops the story, there's no story there to tell. Yeah. Okay. You got, you got somebody hurting on the side of the road. You got someone in need struck by life circumstances. Like, like they were victims at the hands of someone or something, right? And the story is a parade of people who are passing by and none of them stop until this good Samaritan stops. So one of the essential elements of the story that we can pull into the context of our lives is where are you stopping? Hmm. Are you stopping to even just begin to understand? Until we stop, we won't understand somebody's situation. And, and that's the power and the beauty of the concept of NeighborLink, um, which I've been um, blessed to be a part of since just after it's, it's starting working with, with John and then later um, as you came into your, your role here at, at NeighborLink um, and having served on the board many years and participated um, many, many times myself in NeighborLink projects, NeighborLink is a way um, for folks to begin stopping. Stopping everything else that's going on in their lives to spend two hours uh, some evening or on a Saturday morning um, uh, out in the community in a personal and relational way, stopping with somebody uh, as somebody who has a need. And so that's, that's kind of where it all begins. Yeah. That's where the story of the Good Samaritan really begins is when somebody stops and then you see them begin to share somebody else's experience and share resource. Um, not, I'm not just saying financial, sure. but just uh, any kind of resource that the neighbor needs. And in that, in that encounter, things are learned. Yeah. It's all theory until you know somebody's name. And I know for you, that woman's name was Jean. Yeah. And that, that started a huge um, um, transformation process for her. Yeah, um, as a board member for the past you know, 12 years or so, as well as knowing that NeighborLink is a very faith-based organization, this is the root of why we do what we do, is to, to really take uh, all the descriptions that you've said and try to put our faith into action. But NeighborLink tries to also be a very inclusive community, meaning that uh, you don't have to have a faith background or to, to either ask for help or to, to volunteer. Like we, we believe that, that God has created us all in his image and has this plan and purpose for us all, whether you've, you've connected to that reason or not. Tell us, for those that may not have a faith background, since that's a, a big part of NeighborLink, how does this connect? How does this play out in the way you've seen it? Or 
in what way would you encourage those that may not have a faith background to engage in this type of this type of uh, awareness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I appreciate um, our kind of orientation at NeighborLink to invite everyone in our community to begin um, learning how to be a good neighbor, whatever might initially motivate you into that. And, you know, my theory is that if, if you're motivated to do good to your neighbor, um, it's, it's coming out of a, some sense of love, whether a sense of responsibility to love or a, just a desire to love. And at the end of the day, I believe God is love. And so um, whether, wh whether you call it that or, or not, I, I believe that's kind of where, the, where it's emanating from. And that's a place we can all connect connect on. Um, maybe someone would be motivated just to try to do something that would help bless their community. Again, that's, that's rooted in some sense of neighborliness. So mm -hmm. whatever our sense of importance to see our neighbors more as ourselves, I, I, I think that's a win. And it's, it's a big tent um, that we can pitch uh, where I say, if there's any sense of that, Come on, let's move towards it. And um, the more we do, the more we'll we'll understand about its source. I think uh, so. Um, whatever one's motivation, um, if if we're learning how to become better neighbors, then we're learning how to become better human beings, and that would that that's a win right there. Yeah. This is pretty messy stuff. Anytime someone tries to be intentional to, uh, to be kind or generous or engage in someone else's life, um, there's a good chance that we're not necessarily going to get it right. One of the things that, uh, that I'd love for you to share about is what is the role of like, grace and forgiveness in, in this concept of being a good neighbor? How yeah. vital is, is this? Like, Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's hard to over overstate its importance. Uh, we were just reflecting here before we began filming that just after midnight um, this morning, there, there was a, a triple homicide uh, just blocks from where we're, we're filming in downtown Fort Wayne. And um, that underscores the importance of how critical um, forgiveness and grace and reconciliation is in a community becoming a community full of neighbors. Because what happens inevitably in any setting, any context, whether the neighborhood context or uh, whatever the, 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 the community you're speaking of is we're all human. So we're all going to uh, rub off on each other in wrong ways and, and harm one another. We're mm -hmm. all gonna offend one another at some point. And co community cohesion depends on those who have been harmed and those who do harm to figure out how to forgive one another. Uh, because if, if that isn't a high priority or if that's not understood, then um, a community will fracture and splinter um, because um, grudges will be held and there will be, um, that, that just leads to a road of of um, violence um, and uh, disassociation and the, the, the community doesn't come together. So we, we understand even intuitively at some point there's got to be a different choice we can make and that choice is forgiveness. Now when you put that in the context of um, actually trying to serve neighbors in need as uh, NeighborLink sets us up nicely to do, um, within those, con even within those contexts, um, you'll see things, uh, you're experiencing things as a neighbor who uh, desires to do good that, that um, there'll be conflict, either with someone you're serving with or someone you're attempting uh, to serve. Um, and that's part of the process because we're all human. Most times everybody walks away from an experience with, with um, um, just a, a really positive time of serving one another, but sometimes there can be like, well, um, you know, you know, maybe there was an able-bodied person associated with the neighbor we were serving that that wasn't engaged in the process with us, and then 
that prompts us to kind of think about, well, why is that? And it brings up the need, just in that specific example, to figure out uh, how to respond in a way that's, that's helpful, but one that doesn't hold judgment. And it just kind of presses on um, notions that, from a, a biblical worldview and a Christian perspective, it's, it's like these are, these are nudges that the Lord wants, to, um, wants us to um, give back to him and, and change and be transformed. Um, and hear what he has to say uh, in, in those sort of settings. But uh, generally speaking, I mean, yeah, forgiveness, you, you can't love your neighbor if you're holding a grudge. Yeah, so well. forgiveness and grace has to be an essential part of that. And we know that, we know that in our own network of family and friends, if we get sideways with somebody, um, if, if we can't break through that and be reconciled, then, then, there's, then there's a block between us. And, Frankly, if, if we have a group of neighbors that we don't even view as neighbors because they're other, that means there's already a block right there. We're already estranged for them, and we've got to do the hard work of figuring out um, what that estrangement is from. What, what is that blockage? And then figure out how to understand each other more and forgive whatever prejudices we may have. Yeah, so this, this need to engage as we connect relationally uh, through service or engagement or with our neighbor, then there's there's the essence that the relationship can happen and we need to have some grace and, and forgiveness in that. Uh, I usually try to wrap up the show by asking the guests, like, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? And I think we've kind of covered that. But uh, I, the question that I have for you, to the final question here is, in the passage, there is this idea that love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And oftentimes we don't hear much about what it means to that as yourself part. And so to, find, to close up kind of this interview, I'm curious what, if you could share, shed some light on what does it mean to love your neighbor, but love your neighbor as yourself? Hmm. Yeah. Well, if we go back to the story, um, the, the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, um, addressed his neighbor who might have been very different from him and had a situation that maybe his need would have been overwhelming. But it, it essentially ties into Jesus' other teaching is um, what we know is the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do, un, do unto yourself. So, like, um, it, it means that... Um, when we're treating our neighbor as we would want to be treated, then we're also loving the Lord yeah. in that process. And so it's, it's humanizing every situation. It's, it's thinking about it from the um, perspective of how, how we could intentionally love in a way that we would want to be loved. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a deep and rich, Passages that can yeah. get played out in many different, many to an different extent, ways. It's that that essence of stopping. Like if mm -hmm. you were on the road mm -hmm. and you desperately needed somebody to stop, to be, to have this awareness, to yeah. to stop on the way. Yeah, if if you were beat up on the side of the road, um, you understand intuitively what a blessing it will be when when someone reaches out to you yeah. and and sets their agenda and their needs aside to attend to yours. Wherever that we've encountered that, we know how much of a blessing it is. And so loving your neighbor as yourself is to put yourself in your neighbor's shoes and say, well, I could be that person. Yeah. I could be that person. And when that happens, it's a win-win. And that's how we love God is, is loving our neighbors. Um, and ultimately, that's how God loves us. Yeah. Joe, thanks for your time today. Thanks for sharing uh, your perspective, the story of fellowship and how you engage. And I know your story is, is wrapped up in this. Um, uh, as we close Neighboring, we're grateful that you tuned in and uh, hopefully some, some thoughts about neighboring from a Christian or a biblical perspective and or uh, just this idea of what it means to kind of stop on the road and uh, act in, in a way that you would want others to, to neighbor you. Uh, thanks for tuning in and listening. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode.